parents of students who are taking English 9 honors. Um, we have offered this now, I believe, for eight years and have found it very helpful in terms of helping set parent expectations for what their students will be doing and the kinds of writing and thinking that we're asking them to do, the kinds of support that they're going to get in the classroom, and the kinds of things that you should be seeing at home as they're sitting to um, do their writing. So our agenda, uh, we're going to tell you who we are. We're going to talk about our writing structure, which is assertion evidence commentary, and the handout you have uh, will be uh, a company that, um, come on in, will accompany that um, PowerPoint. Um, we're going to look at our writing rubric. We'll go through the writing rubric in some detail. Uh, we're going to, we're going to um, show you a sample of a Watership Down essay. Some essential questions. We're going to read a myth. Uh, we're going to talk about the essential questions with the myth. We're going to have some discussion. We're going to have you writing. And, um, how we help uh, students revise, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. And of course, if we say something that's not clear and you just need it clarified or whatever, please just raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll take care of that. And I am Janice Jewell. Uh, I have been teaching English 9 Honors Block for 18 years. Um, and this is my 19th year at Herndon High. I've done a variety of different roles. One of my roles right now is advanced academic coordinator, so I do know a fair and I also teach um, the dual enrollment English 12, which is the college uh, English 111, English 112 through NOVA, and AP Literature. So I have a fairly good understanding of what your students need to do in their foundational year in high school to be able to advance vertically and successfully in their English class. And I'm Miriam Drake. Also teach English 9 honors. I've only been doing it for seven years, which does not sound so impressive next to 18. Um, but seven years, I've been teaching English 9 honors, and also for a few years block as well. Um, and I also teach English 12 specifically for students who did not pass the SOL. So I really know the SOL. I know how else to make sure students are prepared for that um, as they keep going through their high school career. So okay, so now it's my turn. All right. Um, so the writing structure that we'll be teaching your students about and have in fact already begun teaching your students about this year, we call AEC for Assertion Evidence Commentary. Uh, those are the three parts of the structure. Okay, the three parts of the structure that we teach them to structure their essays according to. The first part of that is the assertion. Another way of saying this that I tell my students about is the tell me. It's the tell me part of the essay. Tell me what your argument is going to be. We can also word their assertion as their thesis statement. And we, in fact, teach them about the thesis statement as the main assertion for the paper, the main argument they're going to make. The assertion has to be something that can be argued. We tell them that we've moved past the middle school level of summarizing, of just delivering information that you found elsewhere. At the high school level, we're now dealing with analytical thinking of people's own insight coming to bear on what they're writing. So we want the student's own ideas, not an idea we can find anywhere else, but from the student's paper, from the student's mind. So it needs to be something arguable that someone else could disagree with. It cannot just be a fact. And it should answer the prompt question. Um, it should actually be an answer to the question they were asked. So an arguable answer to the question being asked. That's the assertion. That should be the backbone of their paper. It should be the major thing that their entire paper is spent around defending. So they've got their argument. They know which stance they're going to take. They know what point they're going to be defending. Now they need evidence to support it. We teach them that there are two parts to evidence. The first part is the context. It always has to come before the evidence quote. So before they quote anything, they have to give us background information. Who is speaking? What is happening? Normally, we tell them it's going to be a short summary of what was going on in the story, because often in English class, they're going to be quoting from stories and using evidence from stories. What was going on when that quote happened? I tell them that they don't want to just drop a quote on a reader and walk away. They need to prepare the reader to understand where that quote comes from, why it matters. The reader should already be thinking that way, thanks to the context, the background information that they have given, that they, the writer, have given. They've prepared the reader, they've given this background information, now they're going to give the quote itself. 
Um, I always tell the students that it's a funny little tidbit about the human brain. We don't trust things as much when they come from other people. We want to know that there's another source out there that this information also comes from. So we say that they want to make sure that they have a quote from somewhere else to prove their argument, to show that it doesn't just come from inside their own head. This is in the text. This is so true. They can prove it. So the quote is how they're going to prove their argument. It should be concrete and from the text. And so ideally, this is going to take the form of a quote in English class. As we go on in the year, as we talk more about nonfiction, as we do our research paper, we'll talk more about evidence that can take the form of a paraphrase or a summary from a source that you still want to cite because it's information from elsewhere. But for now, for, the, for now, at this point in time, we are focusing on quoting evidence, making sure those words come from somewhere else, that you can use those words as proof of what you're arguing. So you've got your argument. You've got proof from somewhere besides your own head to prove your argument. Now that leaves us with commentary, which is always the hardest part, and we understand this, and we talk about it at great length with the students. The commentary is the student showing how their evidence connects to their argument. It's them explaining their insight and how that quote from the book proves this arguable, debatable point that they have made. So it should be all about the evidence still, but it's their own ideas about the evidence. It's how that evidence proves the assertion. This is the part that requires analysis and inference. I tell my students that when you're writing an assertion evidence commentary paper, you are basically Sherlock Holmes. First of all, you're smarter than everyone else. You've come up with the right answer. No one else understands yet. So you're going to tell them, ah, I know who did it. It was the airplane pilot. That's your assertion. And then Dr. Watson goes, what? How do you know? And you, Sherlock Holmes, say, because the painting was moved. And Dr. Watson, aka me, the reader, their teacher, goes, wait, why does the painting being moved prove that the airplane pilot did it? The commentary is Sherlock Holmes needing to explain himself. It's the part where you say, well, because the airplane pilot was exactly this high and his elbow was at this angle, that's why it proves that he was the one to brush the painting. That's the commentary. Why does that specific evidence prove this argument you're trying to make? And ideally, commentary will then connect not just to your assertion, but it's the rich, full answer to the prompt. So it's, it's the so what. It is why this matters, why it connects back to this argument. So one way of thinking of AEC is as a formula. Commentary is how the evidence proves the assertion. Those together, yes. You said that the commentary was the most difficult part. Yes. Is any one of these parts more important than another in terms of when you grade it? Like they could do really well in the first part, result? It's all equal. Um, they all are their own sections of the rubric. Um, some of them are important in the idea of if they don't have a strong assertion to start with, it'll be way harder to have good evidence and commentary. If their assertion is basically a fact, everything else, they're not going to have commentary because their opinion isn't going to come into it at all. Their insight isn't going to come in at all. Um, if they're struggling with the commentary, it might not be as clear how good their evidence is. If their evidence isn't good, they might not be able to have good commentary. So it all really fits together. Um, you want to strengthen all the parts of it as much as you can. And one way in which um, it's perhaps not a, a statement of more importance, but a statement of balance. In a, in a, a well done essay, which, so we'll show you an example here in a few minutes, there is more commentary in there than anything else. And so if you get a solid assertion and, and solid evidence, but you don't have an, but the student doesn't write enough commentary, then that will unbalance what it is. In other words, if they don't explore the so what, if they just say, and that's why it was the airline pilot, it right? It. Then then they haven't done that that mental exploration, that connecting of the dots. And then, in that way, the lack of balance there, the lack of sufficient commentary, makes then the commentary more important in that scenario. But it's more about balance than it is about it being. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So that is the structure. They've already learned about this in class. So maybe some of you have heard about this at home already. Um, but this is the structure that actually you use all four years at Herndon High School. All the English teachers use AEC um, as the structure for essays. Um, so this will be an old friend by the time that they graduate, but I know it is very new right now. All right, if you turn in your packet, uh, you'll see our rubric. It's, it's going to be teeny tiny, so it's probably...
probably easier for them to just look on, on here. I mean, you can shine it up there if you want, but. Um, so this rubric was- It's not was any bigger up on the board. <laughs> is it? Is it? Is it? Okay. It will be uploaded on Blackboard. <laughs> um, the rubric was developed uh, with the support of the whole team probably about 10 years ago. Uh, and we worked with it and played with it. We spent a fair amount of time with it. Uh, the people who comprised the Nine Honors team at that time uh, all also taught AP, either literature or language. And so with our understanding of what our students needed to know and assertion evidence and commentary and if they were continuing in an honors track all the way up through AP language and AP literature in 11th and 12th grade, uh, the kind of language that they would see on those rubrics, uh, we developed this. And I, I will say that since then, I know the 10 honors team has gone back to this document to create their rubric. So their, uh, the language that your students may see next year if they continue on in uh, uh, English honors will be similar. Okay, so you can see prompt. Are they answering the prompt? That is fundamental. If an essay doesn't answer the prompt, it can't score any higher than a D. On the AP, that comes straight from the AP exam. Straight from the, the college board. Exams, if you do not answer the prompt, you can't score higher than a two. What's the prompt? Um, the, the question. The question I was asked that they're writing the essay in response to. Okay. Yeah. We don't have that in front of us. No, 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 not yet. Because it varies from essay to essay. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's the the first section is kind of a global, a global. Um, you know, does it answer the prompt? Is it clearly focused? Is it sort of on prompt? Uh, Etc. And then you see there assertion, evidence, and commentary, where we directly evaluate how strong is their assertion. Everything from strong and clear all the way down to there isn't one, or whatever is substituting in for the assertion isn't isn't driving the essay that follows. Evidence. Everything from the quotations and the context they pick are targeted directly at the argument they're trying to make, all the way down to oh. We have unfortunately received essays that don't have evidence in them. Um, and then their commentary. And if you look in that first statement next to the five, commentary is substantive, 40% of the paragraph, and insightful, offering new truths about the topic. So that's where commentary's balance uh, is a little heavier uh, than some of the others. Um, and then we have uh, two general things. Uh, organization, do they have uh, the introductory material that they need, is the essay organized in a way that is um, uh, logical and makes sense, um, and then also uh, control of language. So how well or poorly are their sentences crafted? How strong or weak is the vocabulary? Is the essay riddled with grammatical and mechanical problems? Or, um, you know, is it, does it just sing? Um, it is worth noting that for the Watch It Down uh, paper, we only use an abbreviated version of this rubric that's that right. only goes that's over correct. assertion, evidence, and commentary. So and control of language. And control of language, because that's the stuff we've talked about in class so far. Um, the other stuff will come up for future essays as we focus on building a bigger, longer, more than one paragraph essay. Yeah, so it's a half sheet that's just AEC and then control of language. So the commentary, it can't be wrong because it's their opinion. Well, Unless as long as they can support it. it. Yeah, so long as they are stating uh, things that are accurate. Okay. Uh, right. If, they're, if they, there was a misread of the book, if they are saying events happened that did not happen, that's a problem. Okay. But uh, something I love telling students for English class, they're not right or wrong answers. There are answers you can defend and answers right. you cannot defend. Um, so yes, it comes down to there's not a correct one. There right. is, can you defend it? Or if they don't answer the prompt. <laughs> Which is not very good. Um, so this is, this is how they will be, uh, and, and this will be stapled to the back of a paper, uh, and it will accompany whatever other comments or markings are on the paper when the student gets it back. All right, so here is a sample Watership Down essay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to point out, and I know it's tiny, and I know that uh, the, the era of reading slides to uh, workshop participants is, is way in the past, but um, this is so you can hear it, because I think that's important, and I'll point out the, the value of the color coding. 
So the prompt, oh, oh, the prompt was at what moment in Watership Down do the rabbits cross the threshold, which is a step from the road cycle referring to when the rabbits enter the world of adventure, or when the hero enters the world of adventure. And if, uh, I don't know how much of the your student summer assignment you had access to, or were involved in, or looked at, or had to listen to griping about. Um, the steps of the heroic cycle is what they were doing with the novel Watership Down. So all of that work that they did to um, create that document is now being used in their first assignments in in class. So, so it wasn't a woohoo, you did it, and then you know, and then we were like, okay, yeah. no big deal, right? The so, idea is they partially have this essay written already. They have a quote about it already because all that they were expect to do over the summer. So they need two quotes to this paper. They got one. They need an answer to this question. They got one. Hopefully. So hopefully they right. started with a step up on this one. And they might change their mind, but at least they've explored the question once before. So, uh, and then we teach them the, the boilerplate things, like making sure that your title is in italics and you have to have title and author in the first sentence and those things. So, Watership Down, a novel written by Richard Adams, features a ragtag team of runaway rabbits searching for a new home to call their own. Through Joseph Campbell's enlightening lens notice, known as the heroic journey, it is easy to distinguish several telltale signs found in other heroic tales. Possible heroic milestones include the call to adventure, the crossing of the threshold, the ultimate boon, or the supreme ordeal. And so all of this is coded because it, it is the context for the essay as a whole. It's not the context that's connected to evidence, but it's the background information that the reader needs to be able to process this paper. Uh, the other thing uh, also is, I forgot to point it, this is a student essay. So a student wrote this. Um, and so now we have our assertion. The moment in the story the team of rabbits is hopping away from the sandal for Warren through the dark ominous woods marks the crossing of the threshold, the point the hero is thrust into the unknown world of adventure. So the question asked, when is that point? This is a direct and clear answer to that question. So this is the topic sentence, the context, knowing what day, oops, I'm sorry. So this is the beginning of our, of our next chunk, right? We've got our assertion. Now we have two kinds, our evidence context, evidence commentary. Knowing what danger to avoid is one matter, but not knowing what fresh danger a place presents is another matter entirely. So this is our background, and now we have the quotation. To rabbits, everything unknown is dangerous. The first reaction is to startle, the second is to bolt. Again and again they startled until they were close to exhaustion. But what do these sounds mean and where in this wilderness could they bolt to? And then they have their citation. Now we have the commentary. How does this connect back up to that assertion? This scene reveals... What does the how Adams 23 represent? Is that a page number? Yes. Yep, that's the page number. That's how you're saying? Yes. That's MLA. MLA. Yeah. Does Adam stand for? The writer. Oh. The author's last name. Okay. Yeah. This scene reveals how the refugees react to new experiences in the woods, their first experience in the unknown world of adventure. <clears throat> in this passage, ambient, sinister, and unknown noises echo all around the refugees, thus causing them to jump until fatigued. This moment reveals not only their inexperience of survival techniques, but also their inability to handle the unknown. It is imperative that such voyagers are capable of having both of these skills, and because they don't at this point in the story, the walk in the woods marks their crossing of the threshold. So I always tell students to look to aim for basically commentary being about the length of their evidence and assertion our evidence, context, and search and add together, and so that student pulled that off. And so that was one quote. They were required to have two. In addition, Hazel's hesitation adds to the sense of uncertainty. Context. Here's our quote. Although Hazel guessed that they must now have gone further from the Warren than any rabbit he had ever talked to, he was not sure whether they were yet safely away. And it was while he was wondering, not for the first time either, whether he could hear sounds of pursuit that he first noticed in the dark masses of the trees and the brook disappearing among them. 
and then begins our commentary. Hazel and his, yeah, go so ahead. getting back to the threshold, so there, is there a specific exact point when they cross the threshold, or that's the interpretation of the, of the student? That is the interpretation. There are, there are three or four points at that point in the story that students tend to argue. One is the crossing of the river, okay. one is when they enter the woods, one is when they leave the warren, and so whichever one of those they do, as long as they defend that point with solid commentary and quotes that say that's the point, then that's fine. All three of those are possibilities. Yeah. So this dark blue text is what you're calling the context? Yes. The context quote, because there was a context something else. Yeah, there, were, there was context at the very, very beginning yeah. of the essay, which is just the, it's background information. Right. What do I need to know? What book are they reading? But you, you expect something like that with a colon followed by the, the quote. We well, teach students several different methods of integrating quotes into sentences. We do teach them that quotes have to be part of sentences. One method is putting a sentence beforehand that the quote can serve as a sample or an example or a summary of. And in that case, you'd use the colon. Another part, another option is using a dialogue tag. The author says, the character says, with a comma. That's also valid. And then there's making the quote part of a sentence entirely and just acting like those words are part of the sentence's words. Um, it, I, any of those are valid. Um, we go over those with the student as well to make sure they know ways of making quotes part of sentences. Yeah. So the commentary here, and if you'll notice, this here after the second quotation, <coughs> the commentary is more sentences. It's longer. So we have Hazel and his refugees are traveling through the wilderness of a dark and marshy forest at this point. Here the phrase dark masses reflects the rabbit's fear of the unknown as the description is both ambiguous and ominous. In addition, Hazel himself admits that he is not sure and was wondering, again proving that the journey in the woods is a new and frightful experience. However, against all odds, Hazel leads his team out of the forest and out of harm's way. And this incident showcases his strong determination and leadership skills. Through adrenaline and fright, Hazel learns leadership skills that will be imperative to his survival during his heroic journey, igniting the spark that ultimately begins his quest. The moment when Hazel's team faces their fears in the woods is the point of crossing the threshold. The menacing woods may even be considered an aid to the hero because it marks the point when Hazel truly takes charge of his people and steps up as a leader. So we have a very clear sentence that reiterates why this point answers that assertion, and then the writer extends. It may even be considered helpful because Hazel has to take charge and lead, lead the rabbits onward. So it's the big so what for the essay. It's the why does this matter? Why did you spend time talking to me about this? And it's because, oh, this point is so important. Here's why. For every assignment, do you give guidance of how long it should be? This seems like more than a paragraph. Well, I call it a big beefy paragraph. <laughs> so, okay. Um, but but do you give guidance? To, I mean, you know, absolutely. Or page or yes. <laughs> um, I always tell the students I have no expectations for length. It can be as long or as short as it takes for them to do what they need to do. For them to have two pieces of evidence in this case and have commentary for both those pieces of evidence. Um, and so I've had students write really excellent single page paragraphs for this. I've had students write two page paragraphs for this. Um, still as a single paragraph, because it's only supposed to be a paragraph. Um, shorter than a paragraph, normally the student tends to be missing something, especially since we're double spacing. So, or I'm sorry, less than a page is rather uncommon with double spacing when you need to get two quotes in and all of this background information and everything in. Um, I do give outlines to the student. We talk to them about all the things that must be included. And so um, I have had students turn in nine page papers before. Um, and that was fine. I graded it. It wasn't a hugely successful paper because he was using quantity to make up for quality a little bit. Um, but I tell them as long as they think it will take for them to do what they need to do. Their summer, <clears throat> their summer assignment, they couldn't fit all that onto the box. No. Yeah. This right. Is, right. Is so I'm, I'm oh, sitting no, there. No, no. So the summer assignment was like, they they were sitting there. They just had like a, a little snippet yeah. area, basically. Like if they got 40 words in there, that was tops. Well, so. the, the summer assignment prompt wasn't the same. This is this is.
take one of those boxes and explode it into a full paragraph. Okay, because I, I was trying to understand in my head. I said, I, I saw what he did in the summer. No. And I was going, uh, he didn't even come. No, no, no. I, no, I'm sorry. What, 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 they would have, what they would have done is, is something like that. You know, uh, wh where is it happening? What is your quotation? How does it fit? That was all we asked. It was very abbreviated. Very okay. But but again, if they if they had done that, if they had where was it happening, how did, what, what is your quotation and how does it fit, then that is one piece of what was exploded for this assignment. Okay, I, I was just trying to connect. Yeah, the dots no, no, no. Sorry, I didn't mean to be misleading. I apologize. Yeah. Um, when they're doing this essay, then you're expecting that it's it's all one paragraph, even if it's two pages. Um, some of them make it two paragraphs, and if they break after the assertion, I'm not griping about it. I mean, it's not. This could be typed, right? Yeah. Oh, it should be. preferably. <laughs> yes. Because that was the problem with the summer thing. The box was so restricted. Well, and some people just you know up, up saved it and then typed you know typed or taped or you know moved things in. We got a fair amount that were typed. So, question? Yeah. Is there, do you guys have a rule for at what point you take a quote and make it a block? Uh, it looks like you're at that. Yes. Edge there. Yeah, we it, it is, but it's it's early. The um, idea we don't expect them to follow the full indentation rules for long quotes. Not not on the first and this was a paragraph. Paper. Right. Um, but but certainly by the time we get to uh, the Odyssey, when we're working with poetry, absolutely they're going to be uh, indenting on both sides and doing it that way. Yep. Is, All right. Is this um, structure, and I'm not asking for a child that's not taking honors, is this AEC structure used in all of English or just honors English? Nope. All, all of it. All of it. Okay. Um, the, they might have more of an entry ramp in non-honors, okay. but I, I've taught 10 regular 10 Gen Ed in the past, and we also used AEC, and it was the expectation that I still learned it in ninth grade. And are there, is ABC one of the several tools that you're using or you know, throughout the four years, or is it pretty much every essay is going to be this, this type of format? Well, it's an underlying foundation yeah. for, how to, for how to structure their argument. Certainly by the time, um, we may be more rigid with it in the ninth grade because we're teaching it to them and we want them to, to follow it and begin to internalize it to some degree. By the time they're getting to the end of 10th grade and 11th grade, they're talking about voice and tone. And when they revise their writing, it's not just, you know, they're keeping AEC, but how do we shift the, how do we, um, how do we uh, enhance the parts so that we're not just writing something formulaic? Um, so it's, it's foundational, and when we, when we read material, we watch for the assertion evidence and commentary in that other. I'm doing that right now with my, um, with my seniors who are duly enrolled uh, with NOVA. And so we're looking at essays from writers and saying, okay, this doesn't read like your AEC Watership Down essay in the ninth grade, but where is it? Can you still find the assertion? Can you, where is the evidence? Where is the commentary? And at that point, they can, they can locate those parts and understand how once writing develops and becomes more sophisticated and their vocabularies have grown and their ability to deal with thinking about the text that they read is stronger, then, then they start playing perhaps with the order of it or the, but the fundamentals are still in there. So like, let's say like for like September, October, they're kind of going in a kind of a structured format. You want, yes. the, you want the A first and then the E first yes. and then the C first. Yes. So this sample here, a uh, good model, if this was, did you say it's double spacing requirement when they're writing it? Yeah. So under a double spacing situation, how many pages would this have been? How many um, I have a copy of it double spaced, um, so I can so split that up with our black one and a half, one and three quarters. Um, it's, it's not even three quarters, it's like one in between a quarter and a half. <clears throat> okay, you bought a page and a half. Yep. And they broke it out into one or two paragraphs? Uh, this one was one. They broke it. Oh, they no, they broke it, it We just did it that way. You did it that way, okay. But when, it, when they turned this model in, it was for one? No, they, they, they broke it out into two, the student did. did. Okay. But we don't mind. We're not yeah. thinking about the paragraph right. structure at this point, uh, just the content. Is this the assignment my son told me he was due on Tuesday? Yes. <clears throat> he said he was going to finish it tonight. I'm like, come on. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. So this is a assignment that's not turned in yet. 
Um, in my class, I, I collected them yesterday. Ms. Jill's class is a yep. uh, class period or so ahead of mine. Yep. Okay, so back to me. So one important thing, and we're going to actually backtrack a bit from the writing component of things to so the reading component of things. Um, so we're going to talk a lot this year about close reading and reading for significant details, which is so new because so many of the students, they're used to reading for like, oh, what's the plot diagram? Who are the characters? What are some of their personality traits? Like really big stuff that's throughout the entire book. But because we want them for this whole year to be using specific pieces of evidence, specific quotes from the book, they have to start being able to read for significant details, for little details that stick out and can give them information about plot and characters without just needing to summarize this kind of information in general. Um, so we teach them to annotate. Um, and that's going to come up with our uh, next unit, more so than this one, our creation mythology unit. Uh, creation mythology is basically a short story unit. It's a lot of shorter text. And so it's really great for being able to pull out significant details together as a whole class. So there are a few different things we'll teach them to annotate for. First is annotations for clarity. Um, this is when you are confused, take notes. I, I go through step by step with them. When they're confused about the definition of a word, they can first try to figure it out based on context. And if they can't, they can look it up and figure out the dictionary definition. If they're confused about the meaning of a sentence, if the, all the words make sense, but something about the arrangement doesn't make sense to them, I tell them, go through the sentence, putting it, it into their own words, uh, to try to overcome that mental block. <clears throat> when they're confused by a paragraph, I tell them, go sentence by sentence, piece at a time, to try to make sense of what is happening for them. I tell them that they might just want to skip over a word, skip over a sentence, skip over a paragraph, because there's lots more to read and they don't want to get bogged down. But I warn them that you don't know which of those sentences, which of those paragraphs, which of those words is going to be hugely important in this book unless you know what they mean. You won't be able to tie them into the book as a whole. So we will teach them about annotating for clarity, making sure they understand as they read. Then we're going to use um, strategies for close reading that are adopted um, from two educational uh, researchers named Beers and Probst. And these are the six secret signposts, is what they call them. Um, these are what they say are the six signposts, specifically in young adult literature, but actually found in a lot of literature for adults too. The six signposts where the author is like, hey, pay attention to me. Hey, something actually really important is happening here. And these six are on the board. I'll go through them one at a time. This will also be posted on our blackboards later, um, so you don't have to worry about if you don't get everything down or anything like that. But first, are contrasts and contradictions. When something happens in a book that is contradictory to what you were led to expect, that contrasts a characterization, a character behaves in a way that is out of character, something happens and you go, wait, I didn't realize the world building worked like that. That seems like something's gone wrong. That seems like an error. The author is doing that on purpose to draw your attention to something. When an, a character suddenly acts out of character, there's going to be a reason that that character suddenly broke. Um, when something happens in the world that doesn't reflect this world that you've come to know throughout the course of the rest of the book, there's going to be a reason that the author slipped that hint in. Um, there's something going on behind the scenes. That's our first signpost, a contrast or a contradiction. Hey, pay attention. There's a reason why something different happened here. Our second one is aha moments. This is things happening out of the blue, suddenly, where you, the reader, are not given any warning, just like the character, that this thing is going to happen. Sometimes the author would have tried to sneak in warnings earlier that sometimes we just miss. And the fact that it happened suddenly to us, that might give us more information to go back and see what were the hints that I missed. What were the important details here that would have led me to maybe predicting this aha moment? Or if there aren't any, there's the question of why did the author have this happen out of the blue? What is the significance of this? Um, we have a moment in Watership Down where suddenly we've been following rabbits for like 47 chapters. And then chapter 48, suddenly it's from the point of view of a human girl. And the students are always like, wait, I had to put the book down and go, what? Why is there a human involved now? There wasn't a human the rest of the time. Um, there's a reason for that. And I actually talk about that reason with my students about the chapter being called Dea Ex Machina, um, for the literary term Deus Ex Machina, or basically the author doesn't know what else to do to save her character, so someone else comes swooping in out of nowhere because the character's otherwise in an unwinnable situation but something happening out of the blue, taking us by surprise. The third thing to look for are tough questions. This isn't any question that's asked in a text. This is a question that the author asks that they don't give an answer to. 
I tell the students that when an author is asking us questions, it doesn't give us the answer. It's because the author wants us to think. It's because the author wants us to wonder, what is the answer? If the, if the author wanted to give us an answer, they give it to us, and then we just have it, and we'd be done. But if they want us to think about it, then there's some reason they want us to think about it. There's some important tie into the overall message of the book that the author is trying to get at. Next, we have words of the wiser. When a character who is seen as a mentor, the older, wiser, the Dumbledore, the Gandalf, wanders in and has some pronouncement to make, pay attention. When the character who is known to be wise has something to say, when Yoda comes forward and says a statement, you know that the author put those words in that specific character's mouth because he wanted the reader to pay attention and treat those words with the gravitas that they deserve, that those are significant words. The fifth signpost is again and again. If something is happening again and again and again and again in a story, there's a reason for that. It's important in some way. The author is making use of the same character doing the same behavior, of the same word maybe. Something is being repeated because the author is trying to draw attention to something about that repetition, to something about the world, to something about their message. And finally, number six is memory moment. It's called a memory moment, but it's really used to refer to any break in the chronology of the story. Um, is the story interrupted for some reason? To do a flashback, a memory, a dream sequence, like Raskolnikov and Prime and Punishment. Um, have we interrupted the flow of the story to tell some other story? And if so, there's probably a reason why that the author suddenly decided, oh, now is a good time to hear a story about the rabbit gods in the middle of Watership Down. Um, so these are the six signposts that we teach students to look for when they're reading. That these are the authors saying, hey, hey, listen to me. There's something going on here. You should catch on to something here. So we want them to annotate for clarity because we want them to understand what they're reading. But we also want them to start noticing important details, important moments that they can then use later as proof in their own writing for arguments that they can make about their reading. This is where the analytical part of our analytical essays comes into play. They notice details that they are able to make meaning of that wasn't necessarily supplied to them in advance. Actually, if you want to, um, I have um, on the Global Drive, I have uh, the Blessing of El Abri Ra uh, annotated. Okay. If you want to just pull it up, then they can see what that looks like. All right, pull it moment, please. Um, do you know what it would be up there on the Google? Yes, uh, Global English, Nine Honors, Beginning of Year, Watership Down, Essay, uh, one of those. Plus, we have Entertainment. That's the, the one. Something there. That's All the right. one. So there is a, uh, this is one of the embedded stories about the rabbit gods, uh, the rabbit trickster, El Arira, uh, and this was annotated. Um, and this is given to them uh, or shown to them as uh, an example of what even and steady and different kinds of annotation look like. Oh, danger. So that's just a. Does the annotation include those six? Some, it does some of some, those. Some and, of and it's not a number four. Yeah. Right, I don't, I, you know, it's not annotated that way, but there are things in there that get at these things. Yeah. Like when El Ra Ray Ra speaks, it might be a summary, but it's, but it's really words of the wiser. So those and with the danger, danger, those are again and again listing oh, different right. kinds of yeah. attacks. Okay. Cunning hearts, okay. sharp teeth, yeah. silent feet, eyes that can see. And Whoa! The repetition. The repetition, okay. right? That's again and again. And we've got words from the wise down here. Are the handwritten words on there the grading of that paper? No, 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 no. I annotated that yes. as a model for, for students. For, okay, as a sample. So this yes. is actually part of Watership Down. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, this is okay. this is the this is what this is the chapter. this okay. is the very first embedded story inside okay. Watership Down. So <clears throat> I have a kid who's very literalist. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If he saw people putting marks on a book, he would absolutely go insane. Yep. Yeah. So, to when you're doing those type of things, do is the expectation that they take yellow sticky things, or because as I said, he's if, if you try to take them away like, from how do they actually do this? Is right, it, they, they're reading an ebook so or a borrowed options. book or a, yeah, they have options. They have options for creation mythology. We print the myths for them, and they can't write on those. They're not in a book. They're just so a paper they, they will get my kiddos will get this tomorrow, okay. and it starts handily enough with the blessing of El Ra, annotated. 
So what you're saying is they should mark up their book to give themselves hints. If well, they own it, basically, yes. Um, they can write up, mark up their book if they own it. If they're more literalist, they can use post-it notes. We have no preference for color, but that be yellow. They can use post-it notes. I'm also, uh, my students, I'll be supplying um, with just a little half sheet that they can use to take their annotations on that gives them guidance of some things to look for um, as they're reading, like specific spots to annotate different things. Um, so th we'll give them options. Yeah, but I just had to bring it up because he would never in a million years do that to a book, I ever. I, I have to do it on post-it notes. I can't do it to the actual Oh, no. Oh, oh my god. My favorite, my favorite books I open up, and they are scrawled with my notes all over the place. I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, when we approach a unit, we start with a series of essential questions. And these are questions that we're going to see and ask the students to explore and examine over and over again as they're looking at different uh, texts. So, um, or as they're looking at the one text and the different parts of it. So, um, when we are start creation literature, which I will begin uh, at the end of tomorrow, after the Watership Down test, um, then they will get this packet and. One of the other handy things about Watership Down as a summer assignment is that very, very early in the text, it begins with a creation story. And so we start with the creation story from the rabbit culture to lead us into creation stories of other cultures. And again, in this packet, it's the blessing of El Arira annotated. So the, story, uh, the questions that they are going to examine for every single story that we read in the packet is what is the job of the story? Why was early man telling stories? What did those stories allow them to think or understand about the world that they lived in? Is there a deity? And if so, what is the deity or the deities like? Are they omniscient? Are they capricious? Are they, you know, irritable? Are they a variety of things? Then what do we learn about the culture? When we look at creation stories from across the world and a variety of cultures, what is it that that story tells us about that culture? What do we learn about ancient Egypt when we talk about Isis and Osiris? Um, and then where is the evidence in the story that points to that? Um, and so we look at things like whether or not the, the people or the gods are peaceful or antagonistic. Is this a mono or polytheistic culture? Um, do they seem to believe in an afterlife, yes or no? Uh, are they nomadic? Is there evidence in there for um, settled agriculture? Or is this Neolithic or before? Uh, is there some kind of structure or rules or government? Um, and then ultimately the extension of that is what do they value? What does it seem like they value as a result? And then what can we deduce about the culture and what the people's lives were like? So for all of the stories that they're going to read and annotate and that we work on in class, they're going to look at these questions over and over again so that they, it helps them explore the differences in culture, the differences in writing, the differences in uh, the way that people thought about themselves thousands of years ago. So we're going to practice with all of you. Yes. And looking at this, these essential questions. So, we have a story. It is Coyote and the Origin of Death. Um, do you have one in your pocket? It is in your packet. It's in your packet. Wait, but I will read it out loud for you. your own so you feel free to write on it feel free to annotate for any of the things that you saw that we um, pointed out earlier all right so here we go in the beginning of this world there was no such thing as death everybody continued to live until there were so many people that the earth had no room for any more the chiefs held a council to determine what to do one man rose and said he thought it would be a good plan to have the people die and be gone for a little while, and then return. As soon as he sat down, Coyote jumped up and said he thought people ought to die forever. He pointed out that this little world is not large enough to hold all of the people, and that if the people who died came back to life, 
there would not be food enough for all. All the other men objected. They said that they did not want their friends and relatives to die and be gone forever. For then they would grieve and worry, and there would be no happiness in the world. Everyone except Coyote decided to have people die and be gone for a little while, and then come back to life again. The medicine men built a large grass house facing the east. When they had completed it, they called the men of the tribe together and told them that people who died would be restored to life in the medicine house. The chief medicine man explained that they would sing a song calling the spirits of the dead into the grass house. When the spirit came, they were restored to life. All the people were glad because they were anxious for the dead to come and live with them again. When the first man died, the medicine men assembled at the grass house and sang. In about 10 days, a whirlwind blew from the west and circled about the grass house. Coyote saw it, and as the whirlwind was about to enter the house, he closed the door. The spirit of the whirlwind, finding the door closed, whirled on by. In this way, Coyote made death eternal, and from that time on, people grieved over their dead and were unhappy. Now, whenever anyone meets a whirlwind or hears the wind rustle, whistle, he says, someone is wandering about. Ever since Coyote closed the door, the spirits of the dead have wandered over the earth trying to find some place to go until at last they discovered the road to the spirit land. Coyote ran away and never came back, for when he saw what he had done, he was afraid. Ever after that, he has run from one place to another, always looking back, first over one shoulder and then over the other, to see if anyone is pursuing him. And ever since then, he has been starving, for no one will give him anything to eat. And uh, we, we committed a big faux pas there. The, the highlighters were oh. supposed to go out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so sorry. So, in the, in the process of discussion, if you would like to also be highlighting and not just annotating. So, speaking of, let's discuss. So, one thing we'll go over this year a lot with the students is archetypes. We started it, but they don't know yet because we haven't used the word archetypes yet. Uh, we've been talking about patterns and finding patterns in stories. And what archetypes really are, are pattern, patterns throughout stories, different stories through different times. And so one of those archetypes that shows up in this one, is anyone familiar? Coyote is the trickster archetype. So he is not necessarily a bad guy, not necessarily a good guy. He's going to kind of go against, like the fox kind of character. Yeah, he's going to go against what the common decision is. Maybe for the best, maybe for the worst. He's a trickster. Okay, so going back to our essential question, what did you guys notice in this story? Um, what details might have led you to think of the function for this story? What do we think is the function for this story? Yeah. Well, I started at the beginning, which is okay. the beginning of Genesis. Okay, we have the in the beginning, a kind of biblical Genesis beginning of times kind of way to reference to things. So we know it is a story about the beginning of some things. What thing in particular? Does this seem to be the beginning story? There was no death. Death, yeah. I see lots of people kind of bowing it to themselves, being no afraid to contribute. But yeah, death, where'd you pick up on that one? What's the thing of death? Yeah, no such thing as death. It's all over the story. And it's in the title. It's all over for that one. So this one seems to give us the origin of death. Are there any other functions that this story serves that maybe are not quite as obvious as the origin of death? Does it seem to explain the origin of anything else? Does it serve as a function for anything else? It explains why coyotes kind of behave a certain way. Yeah, it gives us background for why no one likes coyotes. So coyote right. behavior is explained in this. Anything else? Romans? Yeah, Romans. It was great. Um, this was a year ago, a couple years ago. Um, we had a parent who was also like an expert in Native American culture, and so was able to tell us all about the Cato's and the fact that tornadoes were a huge issue for them. And so that was definitely very much a concern in their time period. Was whirlwinds, was tornadoes, well, and all of the stuff about facing east or facing west. That that would that there's significance in just w which direction they're facing. Is it the rising sun or the setting sun? Mm. Yeah. All right. So. We've come up with several different functions that this story serves. So it's not just the one, but there's several things this one does. What about deities? What do we learn about deities from the story? Deities for this culture. 
There was a medicine man. Okay, there's a medicine man. So there's some kind of shamanistic, magical, something in this culture. There's supernatural, definitely. Anything else giving us hints towards that kind of supernatural side of things? They, they talk about nothing but spirits, right? I mean, the spirit, everybody leaves their body becomes a spirit. So we've got lots right? of spirits going right. on. We, we've got the grass houses that are tied to the spirituality in some way. Uh, so we don't necessarily have deities kind of identified, um, but we do learn a lot about the spiritual side of their culture and these supernatural beliefs they didn't hold. Um, so what else do we learn about the culture? Do we think they're peaceful or antagonistic based on this? I'm hearing some peaceful. What are some hints in here that tell us peaceful? These guys are peaceful. Singing songs. Okay, singing songs is their method of problem solving. <laughs> Seems pretty <laughs> peaceful. Family. Yeah, they're so sad about losing their family. They don't want anyone to die. That's, that's not very violent or antagonistic of them. That seems pretty peace loving. All right, what about mono or polytheistic? Do we get any hints for that? And just to clarify, some of the stories that we read, there will be a clear deity, right? There will be, and 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 the the de I mean, when we read Osiris and Isis, right? And and we have Horus and Seth, and you know, the Egyptian uh, gods. You know, we have clear deities, and so we have. So some of the stories, these questions are a little ambiguous, and some of the stories, they're not ambiguous. Right. The different ones wind up ambiguous in some of that. Right. So, right. I mean, they, they describe the world one as a spirit, and the spirits can actually contain the souls of the body. And when the world comes by, door shut, takes the body, you know, takes the spirits with them. So it's like, in a way, you can kind of extrapolate that. Okay, the world one in itself is a spirit that contain, you know, contains the human spirit. So it's like there's so there a spirit are, within a spirit. There are definitely so, lots of spirits all right. over. I don't know if we can firmly claim polytheistic or anything else, but definitely spirits all over the place. Um, afterlife. What have we got? Do they believe in some sort of afterlife? Yeah, they just kind of drop and go to the spirit land. Yeah, just suddenly there's a spirit land, just out of the blue. Uh huh. Perhaps. Why are they so worried about everyone dying if there is somewhere else for them to go? But it looks like there is somewhere else for them to go. Um, suddenly, out of the blue. But we're um, not with them. So we do have, a, yeah, we do have a bit of an afterlife there. Um, nomadic or stationary? What do we think? Um, nomadic, are they like traveling bands of people or are they settling in one location? Since they have huts, they're, they're building grass huts to settle. Okay, they're, they're building grass huts. They seem yeah. to be building yeah. settlements. We're not like tents that are moving places. So they seem pretty settled. In well, area. They're at the point over here, which is a coyote, is now nomadic. And that's a problem, right? right? That's not a good thing. No. Yeah, so that's nomadic is not seen as good no. here. All right, what kind of rules or government structure are we given in this story? We've got a council, we've got a chief, we've got the medicine man. We've got several different figures of authority. Do we have any one single head, it doesn't seem, even referring to the chiefs? It seems like a lot of things are open to discussion in groups. Um, so they, they do have some kind of hierarchy, but it seems like there's a community-led kind of system. Um, what do they seem to value? What's important to them in this culture based on the story? Yeah. yeah, they value their own happiness. They want to avoid things that will make them sad so badly. Self-preservation of the group? Okay, preservation of the group. They want their friends and family to stay alive too. They want to preserve the community that they have. Value food. They do value food. That's the concern <laughs> that keeps coming up and starts this whole thing. Food is a concern and a value of theirs. All right, so last, anything else? What else can we deduce about this culture and what their lives were like? Just based on this story. What do you think it was like to be a kid back then? Crowded. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that before or after the world was spirit got the north We think after, because that's when they're writing the story. So less crowded now. They wish it were more crowded. <laughs> yeah, they want more people around. Are there just any additional notes in general that things you noticed about the story, things you identified for the signposts or anything? Words that stuck out or decisions that were 
I thought it was interesting that they built their grass house facing east because in a lot of religions, east is the direction of the face of worship. Right. One of the questions I had was that the coyote made death you know, eternal. So how did the coyote come up with this thought process other than everybody else? So where did his individuality come from? Why? Because he speaks up again out of the blue, that aha moment, that everyone's like, oh yeah, it'd be great if everyone lived forever. And he's like, no, everyone else doesn't agree. Where did that come from, that individuality of coyote? Well, and then he was brave enough to but, actually do something right. that helped the system. Yeah. But the coyote was the only one who made the connection between if people stay alive, you're not going to get enough food, and people are willing to sacrifice and say, well, if we keep people alive, we'll figure out food later. So he, he so was probably the only one that was realistic in the, in the not answer. Not the emotional thinker. Right, he was not very emotional about it. And then, so much for those emotional connections after that, because then no one wants him around anymore. Right. Yeah. There's nothing really to explain what he's afraid of. Yeah, why does he suddenly get so freaked out after death becomes eternal? He won. Is it everyone's retribution? It doesn't necessarily specify. It does say everyone doesn't like him after that. But he freaks out even before that happens and just takes off. So, once we read something like this as a class, we will sometimes give them a writing prompt, often, as the year goes on. So, we have a writing prompt for all of you to try out, A Coyote and the Origin of Death, and that is, in many stories, a character takes stand in opposition to the majority. What stand does a coyote make, or take? What are the consequences, and what do these events tell us about Cato culture? So, that looks like a lot of questions, but it's really only one. And so we actually teach the students a strategy for, prompt, for charting out when a prompt seems difficult. It is the no proof T chart. Yep. Um, I can do it off both sides. Oh, how do you see that size marker? Oh, do you need another one? Maybe. So the no proof T chart for approaching a prompt that seems difficult. The idea is. An essay prompt might be asking you to know several things, but usually it's asking you to prove anything. And so even though this prompt asks you to know several things, it's actually only asking you to prove one thing. Only one thing there's a matter of opinion. What would that be for this prompt? The last question. The last question. So what we are trying to prove is something about Cato culture based on the story. And the stuff that we know going in are the other questions, right? We have um, Coyote's stance as something we know. The consequences as something we know. What else do we know that we can use maybe to help inform our answer on what we're trying to prove about Cato culture? What are some of the stuff that came up in our discussion that might be useful with what we're trying to prove here? Some of the other things we know. Okay, so opinions about nomads. Resources. Concern about resources. See how the, I'm sorry, how the questions are designed to flesh out this side. So, so our, our conversation, our small group and whole group conversations are designed to get them to, to flesh out all the parts that they will use because no becomes evidence. When we take this and we make that into assertion evidence commentary, this is our evidence. This is our assertion and our commentary. Connecting the two. Where the importance of it. Did you have something else you wanted to add to the uh, no side? I don't know. Okay. Does anyone else have anything else before we leave you to write? Uh, help your peers out here. Any other items? Okay. All right. So now it is to you. If you turn to in your packet to the page after Coyote, we have the writing prompt written there. Uh, the directions they annotate, which we already did, 
Respond to the prompt using AEC format. Be sure to answer all aspects and use a minimal of two quotations. Write neatly. If you don't get two quotations in 15 minutes, do not worry. We are not grading you. But we have repeated the prompt there. And we are going to give you 15 minutes to think about what you know about the story, what you learned about the story, and try to work that into an AEC structured paragraph. <coughs> Begin. Begin. I don't have any